In this video I'm going to look at constructing a peak model that is aimed at the oxygen 1s that has been measured from a sample from diesel soot and the problem is to try and understand the carbon oxygen chemistry that changes as a function of the temperature for this flake. Now the carbon 1s, and this is typical there's lots of signal but the asymmetry that we associate with the carbon and also satellite peaks they all contribute to confusion in what is carbon on a signal bonded to carbon only and carbon that is bonded to oxygen so we, we would expect the changes to occur in a, a zone which is quite difficult to understand from the carbon on S it's not easy to understand from the oxygen 1s but nevertheless we ought to see some kind of changes as we heat this sample that might give us a clue as to the type of peaks that ought to be in these data just presented with these data we might assume that we've got maybe two maybe three peaks that are contributing to these data so constructing a very basic peak model might take the form of putting a background in of some description let's change this to be a Shirley background and then adding some component peaks let me just adjust the width so that it looks like we're fitting data and perhaps three peaks of this form we fit and look at the residual and this looks like a very good mathematical fit for these data but this is not a good way of constructing a peak model one should always go back to the literature and consider what other people have done in the past and there seems to be some type of consensus around five different chemistries associated with soot flakes now it's not entirely clear that this is the only story but this is a story that does seem to come out from the literature so we have five possible candidates for chemical state of which we need to look through and decide whether you can actually get distinct peaks within the XPS spectrum so here we've got two the ether and the epoxy both represent oxygen single bonded to carbon so we might expect an overlap of binding energy here so we'll, we'll count that one as being one peak that we can identify we've got a hydroxyl that's a OH bonded to carbon that should be distinct from what we see over here so that would give us a second peak then the carboxyl we have a double bond so that ought to be distinct once again and then a carbonyl a double bond to oxygen these are potentially three distinct photoemission peaks and two photoemission peaks that we won't be able to distinguish within the XPS data if we accept these as the possible functional groups within this carbon 1s envelope then we ought to be able to construct a peak model with four component peaks that's three corresponding to these three functional groups and one corresponding to these two so let's attempt to create a peak model based on what the literature is suggesting so rather than having three component peaks as we see here I plan to put in four peaks which will certainly require some adjustment so moving these peaks around perhaps copying and pasting that last one that's the control key down and move that over and that is sort of an arrangement of peaks that might work but then we have to consider what is this structure here if these are the four peaks that represent photo emission what's going on here well it's unlikely that we've got a, an oxygen 1s peak anywhere between 540 and 535 it would have to be some sort of ionic bond that would introduce such a large shift covalent bonds tend to cluster you see these commonly clustering like this in many polymers and you also see when you have a ring structure some additional peaks that are 
shake up, shake off type peaks. So they are lost peaks as opposed to the zero lost peaks that we can identify with chemical state. And in order to accommodate four peaks here, I'm going to have to put in another feature here in order to make it work in terms of a, a peak fit. So I'm actually going to add five. And if I can find that fifth one, it's right there. Oh, that one didn't work too well, so let's pick that one up and move it over. So this is going to be a broader peak that I can justify on the basis of a shake-up peak, whereas these other peaks have to be narrower and certainly more consistent than the arrangement I've currently got. So what I will do to improve this situation is I'm going to set a common value to all of these component indices so that I can then enforce, just based on these four peaks, the same forward half maximum. And that is a guess. It's probably not true. It's probably not true because I believe one of these peaks ought to be a combination of two, at least according to the literature. And therefore, you might expect that one to have a broader width simply because there are two peaks rather than one. and so fitting with this constraint represents a starting point for a peak model where you would like to believe there are four peaks that we can correlate with the carbon as per the literature. The question now is have we achieved a good peak model? And the way we could test this is to use the fact that the spectrum I'm working on is one of a set of spectra that were measured from the same sample under the same conditions. And if I propagate this peak model to these other spectra and fit the peak model to the spectra, if we get a consistent answer then that might suggest that we're along the right track. And let me zoom in and let's rescale so that the spectra all overlay in terms of data but you can simply see despite the residual looking good for these data that so far this has not produced a stable peak model with respect to noise. It's very evident from these results that despite a good mathematical fit which is implied by the residuals that the peak models are failing to produce a physically significant fit of components of the data that can be interpreted in terms of the chemical states that were described in the literature. And the reason that it's failing is because the spectra themselves are too noisy and there's not enough information in terms of shape within the spectra to achieve a fit that can make physical sense. So we need some method for improving our understanding of what this peak model ought to be before we can have any confidence in presenting this peak model as physically meaningful. When we're fitting data with a peak model and the data are supposedly equivalent as we've got here, then the least we should hope for is that the peaks when fitted to the data are very similar in position and forward to half maximum. They may vary slightly in area the problem here is that we've fitted the peak model to each spectrum independently and therefore small variations in noise, background, nonlinear optimization, these all contribute to producing different outcomes. So the question is, is it possible to create a single peak model based on a set of data such as these? And the answer is yes. What we can do is we can fit these data using a strategy that involves fitting all the data to a single peak model. And that single peak model, if it applies to all the data, would be a step towards producing a meaningful peak model in terms of chemistry and physics. When we fit a peak model to data, only the particular spectrum is used to create the peak model. However, if we have multiple spectra overlaid in the active tile, and each spectrum has a background defined, then the peak model 
that is on the first VAMAS block that is selected in the right hand side will be used to fit all the data at the same time. And this is achieved using the fit components button. If there's a single spectrum in the active tile, it would just produce a fit to that one spectrum. But because we have multiple spectra here, when I say fit components, it pulls up a dialog window that says fit to multiple spectra, meaning take the peak model you see here, take the backgrounds that are defined on each and every one of the spectra, and then calculate the optimum fit of this peak model to all the spectra together. So I'll press yes, and a new peak model has been defined for the spectrum that was first selected and we see here that the first spectrum and the fit they don't really align and you might ask why would that be the case all of those spectra look very similar well in fact we've got double normalization on so each spectrum was displayed within its own scale if I turn that off and then overlay the data it's clear now that these spectra actually had different intensities as measured. So these data represent different points on the sample, slightly different conditions for acquisition, maybe sample height. Something has made the intensity change. So what we see here is that it's not surprising that the first spectrum when fitted with the average spectrum, that the fit is not very good. So let's make it so that we can use this peak model that has been now defined by the entire data set so we can apply it to the whole set without seeing too many variations from what we've got here and we can do that by introducing some more constraints so let's add a constraint to the peak that represents the shakeup and we can also lock all the positions I need to do the same for the shake at peak that's got a different component index so we now have fully constrained in terms of position and full half maximum with the exception that it can move a little bit and that's a reasonable thing to do small variation in full half maximum small variation in position the data were acquired from different points on the sample repeat measurements and charge compensation was used so it wouldn't be surprising if there were some shifts small shifts that we need to accommodate and that's one of the beauties of nonlinear least squares you can account for small variations when you fit data so let's just verify that we have a good fit once we apply this constrained peak model to these data and we do so what I would like to do now is propagate the peak model that has been constrained to the average spectrum to all of these other spectra. So I right click, propagate regions, components, auto fit. And let's overlay. And let's double normalize so we can see them overlaid relative to one another. And we can zoom into the region and it's not surprising that we get much more of a consistent answer for these data now while the peaks are relatively stable this is no guarantee that we've actually found the best four component peaks that represent the chemistry that we're expecting in this sample when heated the fact is that these are just the as received samples measured multiple times but if we look down the data set specifically if we go to the very end of the data set you can see that the shape of the peak has changed considerably so despite having obtained a consistent peak model for the initial set of spectra it doesn't necessarily mean that this will be good enough to fit the entire data set which is really the objective we want to see how this sample chemistry changes as a function of temperature
The next step is to try and use the data itself to point to the number of different spectral shapes that are important to this data set. The full data set, this corresponds to a series of measurements, different points on the sample, multiple measurements at the same point, different temperatures. These are all producing a range of shapes and any peak model that we construct that represents the chemistry we believe is present within this sample even as the temperature changes then the peak model should apply to all of these and fit with the same position the same fourth half maximum so that we can infer a chemical state and explain what is happening to this surface and why the soot changes as the temperature increases. One way to interrogate data is to make use of linear algebra. Linear algebra requires spectra to have the characteristics of vectors and this means that we cannot simply shift spectra so they align in terms of a peak. We must align spectra in terms of data bins so that the intensity in each data bin corresponds to the same data bin in all the other spectra. And the way we can do this is to select all the VAMAS blocks in the right hand side and then using this toolbar button we can rebin the spectra. And what this means is if there are any shifts in the data where the binding energies don't quite align in terms of the data bins into which signal is, is placed then this button will shift the signal throughout the data bins so that they all correspond to each other in each one of these spectra that are indicated by the selection in the right hand side. So I press this button and a new file is created and now we can see that if I overlay these oxygen and I just zoom in to the start then there may be some strangeness in the sense that the signal may look level in some instances but each spectrum now has the same starting value and the same number of data bins so these represent vectors that can be used in linear algebra. Now that I have the spectra arranged in one format that would provide us with vectors for linear algebra there is another format that gives me even more information about the spectroscopic shapes and that is if I arrange these vectors so that they are overlaid in the active tile and then I want to convert these separate vectors into one vector per row and I'm going to do that by selecting all of the VAMAS blocks pressing this toolbar button that says tile by row and that creates a scroll list in which each row in the right hand side is displayed as three overlaid spectra and this is a format that is suitable for converting to individual VAMAS blocks for each row by using another toolbar button that says merge irregular and when I perform this operation a new VAMAS file is created and each VAMAS block now contains the merge spectra from the previous file so let me just change the display settings I'm going to display points and just make an adjustment to the size of the points so that it's clear that the oxygen is now a set of coordinates defined by data bins with intensities and similarly we've got the same arrangement for carbon. In fact, if I press the reset button, I can step through and see that not only the oxygen, carbon, but also the valence band are interpreted in this file as coordinates for vectors. So we can now perform linear algebra and try and understand how the valence band may, might change as I adjust the different proportions of spectra, adding, subtracting, scaling. These operations are all possible with vectors
and we will be able to now see if there are any correlations within both the oxygen, the carbon and the valence band. The processing operations involving linear algebra require me to overlay data. So since I've got a lot of data, I'm going to make sure that I can display the data efficiently in terms of graphical efficiency by turning off the points, returning to drawing lines and using a line width of 1. And this means I can overlay all of the spectra with a, a quick refresh rate and that will help when I want to look at and understand how my operations are performing. So here I'm displaying the oxygen peaks. And you can see within these oxygen peaks that they are reasonably noisy. What I intend to do is subtract one spectrum from another spectrum and scale so that I can see how the different proportions of the, these two spectra influence the shapes within the data. So that's how I'm going to try and understand the relationships between the carbon, the oxygen and the valence band. But to do that I would like to lose some of the noise in the data and I can create spectra that are a good approximation to these data without as much noise by calculating principal components and then choosing a limited number of principal components to fit to the data and reproduce the data with the same type of precision that we would expect for pulse counted data and so we would end up with noise reduced data. So let me do that operation. It's applied to the oxygen, carbon and the valence band all at the same time and I will perform a principal component analysis by pressing the PCA button. And once the PCA has completed, we end up with these abstract factors. The name AF is meaning abstract factors. These are the principal components. So they have the same information as the original spectra so all of these spectra in the right hand side, the transformation has made it so that I could reproduce each one of these spectra by simply performing a linear combination of all the shapes that I've now created by PCA. And the trick in reducing the noise within each spectrum is to work out how many abstract factors are significant to the entire data set and then reproducing the spectra, not with all, but just with the four or five abstract factors that we consider to be significant. So let's look at these abstract factors. I will do this by displaying the spectra one per tile. And we can see both by shapes and the order of magnitude how significant these abstract factors might be to the data. It's not entirely based on the order of magnitude because if you form a linear combination that amplifies noise then maybe that will be more significant to the final outcome than simply the magnitude of the noise. So let us look at these. The first one looks like the average spectrum as I said. It's, it's not the average spectrum. PCA does something different from an average. So the second spectrum that we see here, the abstract spectrum, this has clear information in it. You can see a peak that looks very similar to an oxygen 1s peak. So that's clearly got signal in it. Let's look at the third one. That too has information. It's quite clear there's a negative going peak here. So that four and then we start to see maybe one that fifth one here that's that's probably required but all of these others have very similar shapes that alternate so I'm willing to accept that these are an artifact of the calculation and these really represent noise so I'll say five abstract factors are significant to these data so that suggests five shapes are within the oxygen the carbon and the valence band. Let's return the display to a single spectrum, one tile that is, and we'll display that in the page, the full page. So 
this now tells me that I should use perhaps five abstract factors to reproduce these data to get better signal and less noise in the spectra that I'm about to use to perform subtractions and multiplications of these vectors. Now there are a set of buttons here that are used for quickly calculating the reproduced data based on two, three, four, five and six abstract factors. So to calculate the spectra using five abstract factors I just have to press the button that says five abstract factors. Now zooming in it's quite clear that we have a superior signal to noise ratio in these smooth data because that's what's happened I've smoothed the data using PCA and this will be the basis upon which I can do calculations I will now copy all the processed data and the processed data will be the smooth data the column here is selected therefore when I press this button copy VB to new column I end up with my smooth data, my processed data that is smooth, and I can reset that. So we can do a comparison by overlaying the first abstract factor enhanced spectrum and the original data. So we can see the type of reproduction that is possible of these data by five abstract factors. As I go down the list you can see that the quality of the fit is reasonably good for all of these initial spectra. I can now make use of these processed data and do some experiments to find out what might be in the original data. So if I select the first and the last in this sequence and overlay then I can see quite a significant difference between the oxygen not so significant difference but there is some difference in the carbon and some difference in the valence band and how can I accentuate what these differences are well that's by performing a difference calculation between these two spectra and what I mean by difference calculation is that I propose to subtract one from the other in different proportions and then provide a list of spectra in these different proportions that I can then interrogate and see what actually emerges as I look at these different proportions. So performing that operation is now this generate different spectra button that I can calculate a new file and this new file contains well let's see now spectra and I'm going to scale so that the scale always remains the same as I go down this list. I've zoomed into the oxygen and now if I start by holding the control key down and the down arrow button I can step through this list and as I step through the list I watch a change in the shape of the oxygen 1s. I'm not quite sure what the shape ought to be but I can see these changes. Now what happens to the other spectra? Meaning that the, that's the oxygen. Here we have the carbon. That looks fairly reasonable. And once again let's have a look at the valence band. And that looks reasonable too. I'm saying reasonable in the sense that I don't see anything unusual, any mathematical artifacts in these shapes so I'm willing to consider these as possible spectra since this seems a reasonable adjustment to the data as calculated then I'm going to save this and I'm going to save that into a new column what did this do it moved the 
VAMAS block that was here into the new column. And so if I step left, I'm back into my column of different spectra. I've got a record of this spectrum that I thought looked interesting. And then I carry on down my list. And I'll carry on looking at the shapes within the Oxygen 1S. And you can see how they become non-physical. So not all shapes are useful. But ultimately, if I go down this list, I'm hoping to recover a physically meaningful shape that I can then examine what the oxygen looks like. What does the carbon look like? Uh, well, the carbon, despite having a reasonable shape in the oxygen, does not look very good. That looks like there's an artifact in there or two, so I'm going to continue down the list until I see something that looks plausible in the sense of this looks like carbon and these shapes could well be evidence of oxygen bonded to carbon. Let's go over again. To the valence band and have a look. And well, this is plausible. We certainly have signal that would contribute to the valence band in carbon signal. And this peak here looks very much like an oxygen 2S. So I've come up with yet another example of a spectrum that looks plausible for all three of the photo emission processes that I have at my disposal. So I'm going to copy that one also. Now, since I chose two spectra and have formed different spectra, what I've done is I've transformed the two spectra into new shapes and new shapes that I think might be more interesting in a physical sense. So when I compare these two, let's have a look at the overlay of these two components that are calculated. And that actually looks like something that would be interesting. It looks like we've got an initial state where we've got some oxygen and over the range of different temperatures oxidation has occurred in the carbon and we can see shapes in the carbon that would perhaps reflect that. So let's go and do a test of these two shapes with respect to the raw data. It's always good to return to the raw data and do a comparison of the calculated shapes. Let's turn off the normalization against how well these two shapes fit the raw data. And this I can achieve with this LA, Linear Analysis Toolbar button. And the two that I have displayed in the active tile are the two components that I've just calculated. And the selection that I have in the right hand side are the 185 spectra that I've formed from the oxygen, carbon and valence band. And so I want to do a fit of what I see in the tile against what I see selected. And that's what this dialog window is telling me. Two spectra that we used in a, as a basis, spectra in a calculation and targeting 185 spectra. So when I say yes, I end up with a new VAMAS file and I can then overlay these by row and see how well my calculated spectra can reproduce the data. So this is a, a linear least squares fit of these two shapes to the oxygen. And that's a pretty good fit. But that's not surprising because I use the first one in the calculation. The real test is how well does this do as we go through the data set. And it's doing pretty well for the first set, but then these were all measured under the same conditions. And then I go into the data that was measured at 100 degrees. It's not doing quite so well. And this is why it needed four or five abstract factors to reproduce the data. It was not two abstract factors, and that's because two abstract factors would not have been able to account for shapes such as this. 
I've only used two spectra so I can only fit in a two-dimensional space and clearly we've got at least a four-dimensional maybe five-dimensional space so the fact that they don't fit particularly well is not surprising but it gives us an indication of what types of shapes should be within these data and as I go down the list to different temperatures it's doing reasonably well under different circumstances different temperatures and finally we get to the hotter temperatures and because I used the end spectrum in the file it meant that I have a more significant influence from the, from the end of the experiment and therefore I'm reproducing the data pretty well let's see what's happening down here this is 540 degrees and I use 580 degrees so it seems like the first one and the last one were capable of reproducing spectra that were measured at 540 degrees that's useful information it's not the total answer but it's useful information if I want to try and construct a peak model the reason that I've fitted these two calculated spectra to the data is that I want to gauge how well these two shapes are representative of the actual spectra and in terms of the oxygen 1s it's pretty good so that's one example let's look at the carbon 1s again we've got a very good fit to the data so it does suggest that both the oxygen and the carbon are very well represented by these two components that's not to say that these are genuine spectra that we can understand the chemistry of the sample in terms of these they may be but they may not and the only function of them at this point is to try and understand what shapes are required to construct a peak model out of bell-shaped curves so right now if I look at these individual component curves I can make some inferences about what shapes are required within each curve and therefore work out the shapes that will be required to fit the data itself now the caveat here is that we don't have a good fit for the valence band it's not too bad in the sense that the shape seems to follow one another so the red one is the data and the blue one is the least squares fit so fitting the other portions of the data has caused some differences in relative intensities in the valence band this is plausible in fact because these data of the valence band were measured at pass energy 40 whereas the oxygen and the carbon they were measured at pass energy 20 so the difference in the pass energy may well account for the fact that this doesn't fit too well but nevertheless you can see there is a, a similarity so the key is to make use of these component spectra to try and understand what would be required to fit the data itself so the point of calculating these these component spectra is to try and understand the shapes that we need to fit in a peak model if we consider the oxygen then there's a shape here that doesn't really conform to what we would expect for photo emission without any kind of loss structure so I'm expecting there to be because we've got ring structures in the carbon that there's possibility of shake up shake off type structures we have a lot of peaks here we have a lot of photo emission processes so the structure for the background is going to be quite intricate and when I say background I'm including the lost peaks in that concept of the background so I would like to model the shape that we see here by a component that I'm not going to attribute to photo emission if I look at the carbon it has a similar sort of shape and that gives me some confidence that yes maybe that's what is going on I've got lost peaks that I have to account for but again this is really quite a complex structure here shape there could be asymmetry in the primary carbon peak I have no idea about the complexity of the oxides that are involved that produce the shapes we see here so that's why I'm shying away from the carbon 1s but looking at this carbon 1s I do see a similar sort of shape in the background there's enough signal around the photo emission peaks to suggest that I can actually construct a peak model that accounts for these 
complex shapes by something which isn't a bell-shaped curve. The objective is to create a peak model with components that represent chemical state. Now this spectrum is a component spectrum that I calculated from the data and it contains an oxygen 1s that has very characteristic shapes of the heated material. And I'm hoping that if I create a peak model for this particular spectrum I will be able to see how well it fits the raw data and then judge whether or not I've constructed a peak model that actually makes sense in the context of the chemistry that we've understood and the data that we've been given. So the first thing to note is that while the shape of this peak is very nice in the sense that you can see there are more than one component peaks within the main part of this photo emission line, there's a background that seems very strange for a normal oxygen from a polymer for example. Unless you consider polymers that have ring structures such as polystyrene then you see additional signal that is spread to higher binding edgy that it is a loss process rather than the primary photoemission peak. So what I will do is create a set of components representing the chemistry that I believe will sit within the main part of this peak and then I will include a component that will model the loss processes and therefore provide a background effectively from which these other component peaks that represent the chemistry will be placed. The peak model is constructed using the quantification parameters dialog window and we need a background. The background that I will use is this minimum limits background and what this does is it provides a baseline upon which I can place components. And the idea is that one of these components is going to represent the true background and therefore I don't need a background such as a Shirley or a Tugar. I'm going to allow the component to do the work of trying to fit the data in terms of the loss signal that's associated with these oxygen 1s peaks. So now add some components and I'm going to use an LA40 this is a Voigt function. It's integrated from the convolution of a Gaussian and a Lorentzian. So I copied the one that I just created and I'm holding the control key down so I can move the one that I've just pasted and I will paste again and add a total of four component peaks that I believe will represent the chemistry. Now I've got four peaks, none of them have a suitable name so let's change this to O1S. Let's use that to bring in the relative sensitivity factor and what I'll do is I will transfer the name and there's also a way of transferring the RSFs. If I type equal equal and press return, then the RSFs are updated. So now I have four component peaks. They all have the same label. They all have the same RSF. I don't really want them to all have the same label because I think they represent different chemistries. So I will then enter greater than into the name field in A and press return. And what this will do is update the label for each component in the table will be added to the name that I've already specified. So it goes A, B, C, etc. So now I have distinct names for my component peaks. The only one that remains is to try and model the background signal. Now in this case I'm going to zoom in sufficiently to make it so that when I create my component it then fits within the zone that I think is background signal. Now I'll change the shape of this line shape from being a bell shaped curve to a rather ad hoc form which is the convolution of a Lorentzian with an exponential decay function. 
and when I press return I end up with a shape that has two characteristic shapes one because I'm convoluting with the Lorentzian I get a step shape so that might be considered a Shirley like response and then following the peak maximum because it is an exponential decay we end up with a a decaying background that seems to mirror what we see here so this is one way of trying to model data without being forced down the route of a Shirley or a Tugar background and the hopes is that we will understand the photo emission process the better for having a component within the peak model that will accommodate background signal. So let's zoom out and then step into the zone where the data is again using the region. So before pressing the fit components button you ought to do some adjustments to try at least to get close to the sort of solution we might expect. And I would like to adjust that background a little bit. So having clicked it shows me where I can pick it up and move it. Now that stopped. So I'm going to widen the range for this background so it can move about a bit more. The original limits were formed based on zooming in to the data to create the component. So having pressed the fit button I end up with a fit to these data that looks somewhat plausible. I'm not saying this is correct because this is a spectrum that's been calculated. It's a spectrum that could represent what happens to the material when it heats, but we should not assume that this is the correct answer. But it gives us a starting point for looking at the other data, the raw data, and how it fits the raw data. So given this peak model, I can now propagate the peak model to raw data. Let's choose some data that's appropriate. Let's select the spectra, ONS spectra that were measured at 580 degrees by selecting the ONS spectra and then propagating without fitting from the current peak model. I want to constrain the parameters so I don't want them to fit to the data yet until I've actually found a spectrum that I'd like to fit so here we go let's try this one I'm going to lock using the keyword lock in the position constraints and that will force the current offsets between these components to be fixed and then I can fix all of the components, prevent them from moving at all by entering hash and then pressing return. Do the same procedure for the forward half maxima. So in the constraints field, I then enter lock and then hash. So now I have completely constrained forward half maxima and positions. So if this is a good fit, then the areas should adjust for these data when I say fit components and let's see how that works we put the residual on and say fit but without allowing the forward half maxima or the position to move we've obtained quite a reasonable fit that's quite encouraging so let's apply that fit to all of these by propagating And this time I will say fit because I believe that the fit will make sense. So if I display these in the scroll list, I can look through and see how well the fit has performed. And it's done a reasonably good job of fitting all of these data. Some very well indeed. So a very good mathematical solution 
for these samples that were heated to 580 degrees. Let's do the same thing for the 540 degree data. I'm propagating from the one in the active tile that has all the constraints. And now, again, we seem to be doing quite well. Let's apply the same peak model, only this time to the room temperature sample. Even the room temperature sample seems to have a pretty good fit to these data. So that's very encouraging. Let's just propagate to the entire set. Now there are 185 spectra that are being fitted with these components. So this will take some time. Now that the fits are complete, we can display and search through the data to see how well the fit and the data match. Well, pretty good. And we can see that there's significant variation in the peaks as we move through this file. So let's look at this in terms of quantification. We've got a set of component peaks. I've labeled them A, B, C, etc. So if I select components and then remove the one that is the background signal, so that's the one that the complaint was made when the components button was pressed. So I've got now formulae and names that correspond to each of the components that I think of photo emission peaks. I apply the area report to the selected blocks, and they were the oxygen 1s. And now I've got the area report. I can create a profile by pressing the toolbar button. Let's just do a little adjustment here. Let's make it so that we see just the the draw points, no lines. Let's reduce the line width and the size of the shapes and press apply. So we see a trend. A trend, let's see now, there's probably a better way of displaying this. And yes, there's a button that helps to display profile data. And the peak model suggests that we've got three components that are very much similar in response to the temperature changes, and one that starts to increase at the point that the tenet lines off again. So we see the increase occurs for one of these components. So if this component represents the chemistry that changes as the temperature rises, then that would be uh, some corroborating information that say that the peak model has produced something physically meaningful. But you still need to do a lot more research than what I've done right now to come up with a peak model that you feel is best at analyzing a data set such as this.